welcome to today's session. Uh, my name is Mark Barfoot, and uh, we're going to be talking about creating your own ROI justification. And uh, you know, this content is actually uh, from uh, AMUG, which is an additive manufacturers user group, which I've been a part of. And uh, so we're going to be talking a little bit related to additive manufacturing, but the same principles can be used for um, any types of acquisitions that your company may be looking for. Um, so this presentation has been done uh, multiple times and years through AMUG, um, but this is basically combining all those knowledge things that people have given us over the years of what they find works well for your justification. And so uh, we're gonna be kind of walking through it. Um, this is really just to kind of whet your appetite on what you, um, can use in your ROI presentation and, and uh, how you'd use it. And uh, you know, if you have any other questions, uh, my number and that'll be at the end of the presentation. Feel free to reach out to me uh, with further questions. So we're gonna be kind of just going through what the business case report is, uh, talking through a few different uh, examples in that and uh, really getting down to at the end some talks about jigs and fixtures or production parts which if you can tie your ROI to a production or opportunity you can just really magnify the benefit uh, to your organization. So if we start with the business case you know really what is additive manufacturing or or any purchase for that matter what how do you get it what's the challenge well everybody kind of knows additive manufacturing may have an enormous value or your SOLIDWORKS implementation but how do you put it in words? How do you get that yes when you give it to your management team? Um, that's really what we're going to be going through today. You know, so many people struggle with trying to document it well, explain it well, and making sure that they they get their managers to listen to what they've talked about. So, really, what is the business case for those that have never done one before? It's really your summary and explanation of what you're going to be doing and why you need to purchase this capital equipment. Um, so there's different sections uh, of a report. Uh, you start with usually an executive summary, move on to your situational analysis with your, what your opportunity is, what the solutions are, alternatives and risks, and then really the meat and the potatoes that most CFOs and managers may want is really about the financial, the cost justification. Uh, let's face it, the only reason we're gonna be adding things in our businesses is all about uh, saving money or uh, improving uh, the revenue of our organizations. Um, a few tips is, you know, really the biggest thing is make your report concise but thorough. Um, especially I work with a lot of engineers, we always want to just include tons of graphs, tons of data. Um, that gets overwhelming. You know, your management team typically wants something short and sweet, uh, but has all the details that they need. So just try to keep it as concise as possible. The biggest thing I stress is you need to seek help from somebody within your own organization. Um, I can walk through what we do here, and this is based on my experience, but every company has their own little nuances on how they want um, the presentation, how do they want things structured, um, all those kind of things. And so the best case for you is if you can get a buddy in um, your finance department that you can work with, somebody that understands what the metrics they want, how to calculate numbers, what methods are uh, acceptable, that's really going to help you in a long way. And the last thing is really to know your audience, and we're going to talk a little bit on the next slide on that. You know, you need to understand who are you presenting to? You know, we still have several corporations where it's more this formal boardroom, like in the top right here. Um, but then there's a lot of more new startup type styles where it's, you know, the style of the company is a much more relaxed style. You know, if you're probably in that formal boardroom, they're expecting a fairly thick justification report. Um, other places may be much more lenient, much more reflective. And I still remember a story from uh, a presentation I went to where the CFO of Google was saying that, you know, they basically have a couple page thing that they go through and that's their justification. Um, and they were buying Cessna aircrafts or something like that for their Google Maps. You know, other corporations probably need a lot more documentation than that for their justification. So you just really need to understand who your audience is, what you need to do. You also need to understand who you're presenting to. What's their opinions? What's their style? Do they have preconceived notions? You know, maybe, you know, if we're talking about additive manufacturing, maybe they bought a, a consumer grade mach machine and have had lots of problems with it. Well, you need to make sure that you understand that so that now as you're proposing maybe a production-based machine that you can distinguish and explain why uh, the production-based machines may not have those same factors. Um, also think about the context of your company. Last thing you want to do is present your ROI right at the 
when there's a spending freeze, or maybe the last quarter was a horrible quarter for the company. Those typically not good times to try and put through an ROI. But if the quarter was a really good quarter, that might be the great time to put it through. So just be aware of that. And I think the last point here is really the one that I think has been beneficial for me as well is really select your allies. You want to have other people that can sell the story than just you uh, when you go to present things. So, you know, whether it be your boss or somebody else in the organization, maybe another VP, the more people you can get on board even before you maybe go into that formal meeting, the better. Because the one thing is, if you get a couple of VPs excited about it, chances are they've already talked to the other VPs, they've already talked to the president. It, it maybe makes your, your presentation more of a, a rubber stamp product process versus actually, um, you know, being challenged and, and questioned. Kind of continuing on on that, you know, I've listed up here CFO types, you know, this really can apply to any manager or CEO, uh, CTO, etc. any of the, the managers that you're presenting to, you need to understand what their style is. And, you know, I, you know, when I first started uh, doing these, when I worked at Christie, you know, the CFO, the president and the VP were much more, um, they were kind of in this visionary avenue down here or, um, they were revolutionary. So, you know, they were willing to work outside of formal structures. Uh, you know, one of them was more of a conductor where they worked on gut feel versus hard data. Those type of people are much easier to try and get justification and approval from than maybe somebody that's more of a traditionalist that doesn't want to work outside of the, the established guidelines or um, the politician that wants a full group approval. Those are a lot harder to do. And I found that as, managers changed, certain managers were a little bit more challenging and you needed to make sure you tailored your report for what they were looking for uh, versus just using um, the maybe the method that you'd used before. So just be aware of that and know who you're actually presenting to. A couple other points here, you know, timing's everything. As I said, make sure the climate's right when you present. Secondly, you know, be willing to change direction when you're in the middle of the report because maybe you think you have a, a real need. You know, I'll use an additive manufacturing example where maybe you can see the need from a prototypes for, pro for engineering and you're going to do a few prototypes every few months or every few weeks for engineering and you see this benefit. But when you do the math, you're looking at it and saying, hey, that's still a three or four year payback just on that need alone. But meanwhile, you start realizing, hey, I could do jigs and fixtures, or I could do this for this other department, and all of a sudden, you know, their benefit, you know, maybe that jigs and fixture can justify it just on one fixture um, for the whole thing. And we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. But just be willing to change your direction um, if you you feel you need to do that to be able to get the support. The other thing I would caution you is don't underestimate the adoption time for engineering to take advantage or adoption time of anybody in the organization to take advantage of it. You know, when you're doing your math, you're better to be um, a little bit over conservative, I would say, because you want to try and make sure that you do hit your numbers. Because if you can be over conservative and then come back and say later, hey, we, we implemented it in less time. We, we took less time to pay back the valuation. Um, that'll just help um, moving forward. Um, the other thing, you know, if it's talking about additive manufacturing or any any purchase for that matter, you know, that whatever you're buying may not be the core part of your business. You know, maybe the machine shop or the additive manufacturing center is just a portion of it. You know, there could be a whole manufacturing line that needs to be retrofitted. So there is going to be some struggle of, you know, does the money go for the additive manufacturing or does it go to put in a new assembly line? So just be aware of that. That might change their decisions and you need to be aware of those major purchases that may affect you getting your um, approval put through. The last thing is, you know, what's your competition doing? You know, use it as leverage. If, the, if you know your competition's using it, Tell, tell the, your managers that, you know, last thing companies want is to get uh, behind the, their competition in what they're actually doing. Think about price considerations. You know, I, I worked at a university for a while as well. Um, you know, government grants are huge uh, there. And so, you know, they, they use them a lot, but many organizations forget about government grants or tax rebates that are available. So pay attention, uh, stay tuned for those kind of things as well. The other thing I word of caution is, you know, you may feel that that's a great deal because you've you negotiated or you found a, uh, an offer. 
just be aware that your management may not think so. Maybe it's things that you aren't as aware of that, you know, to you that's a huge discount, but to them a couple percent isn't or something. Um, or it's not a big discount because they've got this huge other purchase that they need to do as well. And so they're solely focused on that. So just think about that as you present it. So now we get into the actual presentation itself. So, you know, the executive summary, you know, it's really going to make or break your case and it really needs to be short. It's challenging with what the solution, two or three paragraphs and emphasize those numbers. Um, you know, a few points, be succinct. It needs to be short and sweet. Chances are that's maybe all the CFO, CEO, or that reads. Uh, they will typically probably read your executive summary and maybe skim through some of the numbers at the end. So it needs to have everything in there, but be uh, sufficient that they can just read it. Be compelling, you know, excite them, get them interested in what you're actually trying to purchase. And write it last, because you need to have the data and you need to make sure you, you've understood everything about the whole process that you're going through. The next thing you go into is what your, what's your current situation? So describe what you're trying to improve, um, state who's affected, but try and hone in on one justifiable aspect. Too many people I see try to solve world hunger with their justification, and that's just very hard to do and somewhat unbelievable. And so you really want to try and narrow in on one justifiable aspect that people will see, see the benefit of, and you don't want to put in too much more because sometimes having too much makes it seem unrealistic. You know, Often if you say, hey, this million dollar machine is going to be paid off in a week, that almost seems pretty unrealistic. So you want to make sure that you're um, using numbers that make sense. So, you know, as you're talking about the proposed solution, you know, what are you proposing? What's the investment? How long do you think it's going to take? Um, and deal tell those benefits, you know, stress the hard numbers, reference those softer gains. And, you know, when I'm, what I mean by that is, you know, if you've got numbers and data that you can back up, include that in your presentation. You're better to do that than, than reference some of these software gains that yes, you might get to market faster, but maybe how do you quantify that? What's that value? Now, if that's a value in your company, don't forget about it, use it. But some of those things are in certain companies are very hard to put a dollar value against. You wanna state your end result, wanna lead with those hard numbers. And again, as I'd said, don't take too big a piece of the pie. You know, you wanna start off small and work your way uh, up to it. You, you, even if you see all these other things, and, I, and you can see that all the time in additive manufacturing, because once you get a system in, there's so many more things you may be able to do with it, um, but narrow in on a couple key aspects, do that part well, and then the other stuff will follow in afterwards. Alternatives, so then you list your alternatives, list the options, why you did it, why you didn't select them, list the possible risks and state how they're gonna be addressed. These ones are honestly a challenge to do in some organizations because number one, you wanna only list the obvious options. You don't wanna state every risk under the sun and I've seen that with engineers too, you, you know, you're very cautious sometimes and you may list 25, 30 items that may not really happen. Um, you wanna list just those obvious things. But be very careful to not eliminate those risks that the audience may be specifically attuned to. So if you're presenting to somebody and maybe, maybe they're the safety officer of your company, you certainly better make sure you include safety as one of your items. So you wanna make sure anything that the audience is gonna be attuned to, that you cover those things. Now we get into actually how do you justify your purchase? Well, there's really two approaches. It's all about the money. You're either reducing cost or you're increasing revenue. Um, and when you start looking at the costs, well, it's going to be what's the capital expenditure that you're spending, but what's that, and then what's the ongoing costs, and then what's that return? How much time is it going to take to pay back that investment and start making more money from that investment? So there's several different measures, and I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but just to make you aware that there's several different, and I've picked four here. There could be others that your company has. Uh, return on investment is really a simple one, gain minus expense over expense times 100%. That one's used a lot by companies, although I would say the one that I found the most is the payback period, which is really where you set the gain minus the expenses to zero. So how many months, years is it going to take from when you've spent that money till all of a sudden now you're starting to make money from that machine? Uh, that's one that a lot of people use. Um, 
a couple others are net present value, and you can see the formula there. Uh, you can plug in that formula and use it. There's a few companies that use it, although as I said, payback period or return on investment is probably the one I hear the most of. Um, and then the internal rate of return is basically setting that net present value formula to zero and solving for R. So again, you just need to make sure you're using whatever formula makes sense for your organization. The other tip is make sure you're doing it for your decision maker's budget. Last thing you want is to say to the engineering manager and say you're going to spend a million dollars, but the production manager is going to save all the money. Um, you want to make sure it's for the decision maker's budget. This gets even more important in larger corporations because budgets are very uh, sometimes narrowly focused and people are only focused on their own internal. Smaller companies, typically a lot of the senior managers are more adept at probably looking at the overall picture. Or if you're presenting to a president or, or a senior VPs, they, they do often think about across the different business units. Be realistic. I've kind of talked about that a couple times, but just really try to be realistic on what you're, you're proposing. And iterate it. So if the number seems too high, you know, you've done your math and you're at a seven year payback, it's probably still too high, iterate, add more things in, try to get that number down. And avoid threats to others. Be cautious. If you're putting in additive manufacturing, last thing you want to say is that you're going to shut down the machine shop because you're bringing in additive manufacturing. Well, if the machine shop manager is one of the ones that has to approve it, that's probably not going to go well for you. So you just need to uh, be aware of that and make sure you're not threatening other departments or other people. When you go in to add an AM machine, this is more specific about AM machines, you want to make sure you've thought about everything. Think about all the costs related to it. What about ancillary equipment? What about post-finishing tools? What about the learning curve that you might need? Is it functional? Is it cosmetic? Um, what about the facilities and people that you need? Do you have the right people? Um, you know, this is a great time to come to the Symmetrics team. You know, we're able to uh, help you with that, help you explain it. Be aware though, some vendors aren't as open to tell you some of those things. Um, AMUG is a great opportunity where maybe you can go and hear from actual users sometimes of how they're actually implementing or using the technology. So um, just do your homework before you actually go and purchase a machine to make sure you've thought of everything. So then I'm gonna kind of use as a case study, uh, I used to work for Christie Digital Systems and this was an example of when we purchased a machine and moved from a Titan machine to a Fortis 900. Um, the numbers have been changed a little bit, Christie asked me to do that just to uh, keep it more generic, but the, the idea and the concept and the, and the rough values are very roughly there. So when I look at it, you know, this was the cost of the machine, you know, we had some ancillary licenses and software we needed to bring in. There was some installation and training costs. There were some shipping costs, some IT expenditures to run some network cables, et cetera, and a little bit of facilities modifications that needed done. You know, certain technologies may need even more facility modifications. If you're putting in a metal printing machine for a DMLS-based printing machine or a SLS-based machine, it might need even more facility modifications. So you just need to be aware of what you need to implement. And then we move forward is to what about the ongoing costs? So, you know, there was a maintenance contract. Most additive machines, you have the option of putting on a maintenance contract. Maybe your company doesn't want to do maintenance and they just want to do a pay time per material. You just need to account for that in your numbers. Um, think about routine maintenance costs. And then typically you would also consider your materials and your labor and your facilities. For the case of this example, I've left that off because it's really dependent on the materials and the processing that you're doing. Um, but you work with your uh, with with us at Symmetrics, and we can help you give you some estimates of here's how much material you'll use for that part, here's how long it'll take, etc. Because you want to to account for those numbers in your overall cost. And so we basically plug that into a spreadsheet. You've got your capital number and then your ongoing expenses. And we assume those expenses are the same year over year. Maybe you need to increase a cost of inflation or that in there. Depends on what your company requires. Certain companies do it different ways. And then now we start getting into what's the return. So we recommend doing a three-tier approach, going from your hardest, easiest things down to the softest. And uh, I'll kind of explain a little bit of what that actually means. So the first tier, these are ones where it's easy to justify look at what you're saving. What are you doing now that you're going to convert? So if we're talking out of manufacturing, 
what am I sending out? So I'm going to a service bureau. What's those costs? Pull those invoices with your finance team and get that data. Or what are you doing in-house? Maybe there's some machining work that now you could do on the 3D printer, which might save you cost or time on those internal CNC machines, etc. Go back, find data. The other thing I would say is, as you bring in equipment, out of equipment, make sure you start taking data the day that equipment hits your floor. Because the more data you have, the easier you're going to have when you do further justifications, etc. Um, and this is one of the challenges some companies have, is they just don't have the data. And so you need to work a little harder in those companies to try and get data that makes sense. This is some example of some data we had uh, when I worked at Christie. And so when we first implemented additive manufacturing there, um, myself and the VP of engineering had set a rule where we wanted to have a really quick turnaround. That was our priority. We wanted to have things turn around within 48 hours. And so we set this nominal number of hours. Once we hit over that hours, our usage was too high. And so you can see we were starting to hit over that. Well, as the company grew, it got worse, right? And so we started to find now we're not even able to do it in a 24-5 work week. And so and we're slowly getting closer to the 24-7 work week. So depending on your organization, the, this could be data saying, hey, we're starting to hit these peaks over this, this limit, I need to go out and justify a new machine. Other companies may have a challenge where they want you to be at the 24-7 work, which is very hard, I have to admit, for additive equipment because typically you're using it for um, prototypes. And so you have a cycle and a, and a phases that you have to go through. So you're not necessarily fully at 24-7 operation all the time. So Go and look at data, use that as some of your backup. So when I started looking at the costs, because we were hitting over those numbers, we were outsourcing things. So we created some buckets and averages and documented it. We looked at the expediting fees, the shipping costs to ship things in. We looked at internal cross charges as well. And so if we you know, plug those numbers in, you know, we were outsourcing about $100,000 of, of parts at that point to a service bureau. Um, we had a new project that was just starting and we knew the parts that it would need would be about $50,000. And then in addition, we knew there's machine parts that we could save 30,000. And back then there was some special savings where we were able to get a uh, lower cost of material with the newer machine. And so, you know, we added all that up and that was our cost uh, benefit. So we go back and plug that into the spreadsheet. Now in this case, we assumed the same number moving forward, um, partly because you could say, hey, we had this new project, maybe that was a one-time thing, but as the company was growing, we kind of knew there was always going to be one of those new projects the next year that would probably keep it expanding our business. So we left that and value the same consistently. Other companies, you might need to vary that. So as you can see, as I put that through, I'm at a 2.8 year payback. So for Christie, our rule of thumb was it needed to be less than two years. So I'm still too high. I need to try and bring that number down. So then I go to my tier two. So tier two could be the increased prototyping, right? So if you're putting in more prototypes, you're gonna use more material, you're gonna need to run more. Um, because it's internally, you're, you're, you've got that ease and use of, of using it, so there'd be more parts that you'll be able to actually produce. Um, you can also look at things like expense reductions. So what about error detection? So if we're going to bring in a 3D printer, maybe we can reduce tooling reworks because we've prototyped it prior to go to tooling. Maybe we can reduce ECOs. You know, typical companies, any ECO is anywhere between $300 to $500 to do. Well, if you can save even 20% of your ECOs, that could be a fairly large number depending on your company. Um, maybe you're delaying the product launch or the product launch would have been delayed if you weren't there or miscellaneous expenses. Maybe you're improving the product, right? Is there returns or warranty repair work that you're not gonna have to do that you could save that money? You're gonna get back into the market faster or you're gonna be able to do the multiple iterations and get a lower tooling cost or a lower manufacturing cost. You know, We saw that at Christie where we were able to combine parts together to reduce that labor cost. So what we did is we looked at those and said, okay, uh, oh, labor reduction as well. But we looked at it and said, for the iterations and the manufacturing costs, we estimate, we had some math we did that it was about $20,000 in savings. We looked at the error detection, the ECOs and everything, and it was a $40,000 in savings. The warranty repair work was about a $10,000 in savings. 
we knew we had return to market. It was getting us back into market and it might have reduced the labor, but I had a hard time figuring out what numbers to use for that. So I left it off the calculation. And what I would have more done is put that as a note at the bottom, just as a new thing. Because even if you can't get a number to it, many of the managers or VPs are going to know in their gut that that's a, that was a challenge with the company. And even if there's not a number to it, they know it'll be a big benefit. The other thing to look at is income. What are you, are you going to be able to increase your sales? So you're going to get to time to market faster, which might increase your sales or allow you to get more market share ahead of your competition. You might be able to do more frequent product improvements, which again, gets you more to market or people to maybe you know buy your product more frequently. Product improvement, the appeal, the look and feel, the ease of use, aesthetics, or get more product launches. So when we looked at it, we said, yeah, we definitely are going to get a time to market reduction, increase the market share, but, but we didn't really have a great way of calculating that. So I just, again, that was one I put down as a, a secondary note, just saying, hey, we're going to allow us to get to market ahead of our competition. The product improvement definitely improved the look and feel of the product. But again, how do you put a look, a cost to a look of a product? It's sometimes harder to do. So maybe just state those as a soft improvement. Product launches, maybe, you know, I would, it might occur. Um, and then, you know, once we started plugging those numbers in, so we added these tier two in, now you can see we're down to a two year payback. So we've went from the 2.8 year down to two year. And so as I'd said to you, Christy, as long as I was under two years, I was okay. So at this point, I would have quit the calculations and I would have presented it. Unless there was some other glaring thing I could add, I assumed that was okay. I, I challenge people that I would say don't want to understate things or, or sorry, overstate things. So you don't want to take it to the point where it really is a two month payback or a two week payback on a half million dollar machine. That's probably going to seem unrealistic, even if it is. And believe me, we've had additive manufacturing examples that pay back in that short of time, but just sometimes managers may not believe it. So you're better to say it's going to be two years and then go to them in a year and say, hey, we said it'd be two years, but we paid it back in a year. How do you think your next justification is going to go? It's going to go a lot easier because you've already proved that you can calculate things well. And then the third thing to look at is the value of speed. Um, we recommend omitting it from the calculation or only including it if you absolutely need to. And really, the reason for that is, are you the limiting factor of the schedule? So what if you're able to produce this prototype faster or get this one part done faster, but there's an injection molded part or maybe there's an electronic circuit board that takes 16 weeks to get in? It really isn't going to benefit your overall schedule unless you are in the critical path it's not going to give a benefit to your company. And so if you are, then maybe you could include it, but just be very cautious. Because the other thing I found um, at Christie was, even though we were able to do things a lot faster, we didn't necessarily release a product that much faster. What we did is iterate more times, took the same time, but the product we put out was a lot better. And so just be aware of that and be cautious if you're trying to use that as part of your justification. Now I want to kind of move into, well, say you're looking at it from an engineering perspective and you just can't get it put through. Maybe you need to look bigger. You need to look at the company-wide thing of what you could do. And really what I'm talking about is if you can move it into manufacturing where you're now taking talking thousands or hundreds of thousands versus just a few instances in engineering, you can get a huge return on investment in a very, very short time. And so a couple examples of that are some jigs and fixtures or production. And I'll show you some. So in terms of jigs and fixtures, you know, when I talk about jigs and fixtures, I'm talking about all types of jigs and fixtures, from gauges, test fixtures, work holding devices, alignment aids, ergonomic tools, all those kind of things can benefit your production. And many of them are often simple and you just didn't do it because without additive manufacturing, it was too complicated, too time consuming to generate the POs, get the parts machined or get them brought in from outside. Where if you have a printer there, you can just generate a CAD model, send it to the printer, no drawing required, and actually get your parts. And I'll give you a couple examples of this. So Digi International is a company that uh, had been looking at bringing in a machine. And so this is where they were using it for engineering efficiency. 
And so they showed that it would be a 2.6 year payback for them to bring it in from an engineering efficiency alone standpoint. And so again, with my rule of thumb of two years, it was still too too high. It wasn't paid back enough. Well, somebody else came in and looked at their facility and they saw this new opportunity. They basically had this uh, PCB assembly area where they had to manually apply tape, uh, mask it from a, when it was went through the one process. It was taking 60 seconds per PCB for them to do that masking. Somebody said, well, hey, what about if we 3D print a mask that snaps over that? So now we're able to take that labor from 60 seconds down to five seconds, so a 55 second save reduction, and they use their burden labor rate. Again, make sure you use your finance recommended rates. You know, it's not necessarily the $20, $50 an hour people actually physically take home. It's probably a burden rate, which includes overheads, et cetera. But if they use that number, it was $123,000 savings. That one part alone almost justified the purchase of that one machine. And so this one part that builds in 24 hours, or maybe maybe 48 hours at max, could justify their savings. And so um, think about those kind of areas when you do it. The next example is some fixtures. So Thogus is a company in Ohio uh, that I have the privilege of going and seeing, and they really took it to heart, and they focused a lot on 5S tools. And the biggest thing they found is most of those tools didn't occur if it had to get sent out. But by having it internally, they started implementing these little fixtures and little tools. You know, a couple examples. So they had these nozzle holders or rod holders, you know, round type parts. So typically in the injection mold, they'd pull the mold out. These would get put onto a bench. Well, they're round. They'd roll off. They'd go under the bench. They'd go under the machine. They'd get damaged. They'd get thrown into a box with a bunch of other things and then have to be sorted through. They found they actually saved 17 minutes per changeover by just having these fixtures right handy at the actual machine. And that gave them about a $21,000 a year savings. Huge savings just for a couple little simple fixtures, honestly. Um, they then started looking at what about CMM fixtures? Fixtures to hold their parts in the CMM process allowed them to put parts through the CMM process faster. And so you know, they saved $23,000 per seven hour shift uh, or sorry, seven hour reduction per batch, and then they had about 10 of those. So that was a $230,000 savings. You know, that can justify, you know, a Fortis 450 type machine easily, um, getting to the point of maybe even be able to enable to just, justify a Fortis 900 type machine. So think through those kind of applications. And then production. You know, the last thing with production is, you know, consider all the benefits. You know, you're not gonna have to do tooling. You're not gonna have maybe rework costs because you're gonna only print on demand as people need them. You maybe not have as much labor or line costs, inventory, space allocations, facilities, et cetera. The biggest caution with the production at this point is just make sure you understand your qualification process. You know, certain parts take more qualification than others. And so make sure that you can get them qualified and you don't underestimate the time it takes to do that. Uh, say for example, you're doing an aerospace part that could take a little bit longer than others to actually get certified. You know, a couple examples of these. So this part on the bottom left corner is a part I did uh, when we had a small service bureau through Hyphen, and uh, we had a customer, it was a nuclear customer, and uh, they needed 60 pieces was their total volume for this small part. It's probably about three inches by three inches by a couple inches high. And so we were able to iterate two or three iterations and produce their production parts in less than two weeks. Um, you just can't do that with other processes out there. You know, these little clips up above that are really intricate little tiny clips. There's nothing major to them, but we only needed a few of them here or there for production. And there's really minimal material in them, and they're so small, we were able to just throw them in on builds that we were doing for other things. And we just kept some couple bins by the machines, and every few builds would get a few of them off, and production would just keep coming and grabbing them from us. And so huge benefit uh, to do that. And then on the right, the picture there is a, a part uh, from a company called Eclipse Scientific, where basically this goes over bolts to detect uh, breakages and, and fractures and stuff in the bolts, and like an x-ray scan. Well, they needed to have all these different sizes and shapes for all the different types of bolts and that that you might find in an oil and gas facility. So we were able to print them as they needed them, do a couple of special post-processing uh, features on it, and they were able to get their production. 
Before that, they were buying thousands of dollars of tooling, tooling parts, and Murphy's Law, they always were tooling the wrong size that the customer actually needed. So you can look at using those kind of things. In closing, I just kind of want to talk about a, a couple other examples. So we've talked about additive machines, but you can use this type of process with any type of process in your building. So, you know, this is post-processing, which is another product that uh, we uh, represent here in Canada. And this is where you can actually take your parts and clean your parts faster or easier. It's mostly focused on additive manufacturing, but basically the current method people are using is manually picking away or cleaning parts manually. And so, you know, in this example, you know, it was costing them about $10 uh, per part to do the post printing on those parts. By implementing a, a automated pro processing system, you know, they could do 30 parts at a time. The operating time was three hours, but a technician didn't need to be there. He only took 35 minutes to actually process that type of part. Well, now all of a sudden, the cost per, per part went down to $2.14. And so the machine is around a $40,000 purchase. Adding in some detergent costs that you do, you're down into a, like a, maybe a 12 week payoff. Um, huge savings and you, know, you could have hundreds of thousands of dollars of savings over the year uh, by using that solution. Another example would be the similar thing, but where you're manually um, sanding parts and so you know that's sometimes a process issue where people want to smooth out parts and don't think that your part just because you have a few parts it's not enough well look at this case they've got four parts per day but it was taking them 240 minutes to hand sand each one of those parts so it costs them almost 221 dollars per part just for the post processing by using the uh, nitor uh, tumbling system they were able to reduce that labor down to about five minutes per cycle and you know down to a two dollar savings this hundred thousand dollar basically machine was paid off in 19 weeks huge savings very quickly and so you know think about that you know maybe it's your solidworks app implementation that you want to look at think about the pdm and maybe the time that you're going to save from doing it or it's an analysis tool where you're going to not have to produces many prototypes because you've analyzed them and you know which ones you're going to need to do. So think through all those kind of things as you try to generate an ROI. And so, you know, just in closing, I hope this was useful to just help you give you some ideas of what you should include in a business case and kind of the approach that you could take. And, you know, like I said, I've justified a lot of equipment. You know, when I was at Christie, we brought in, I probably brought in about 10 to $15 million of equipment uh, over a few years there. Um, and many other companies have actually taken what I've, I've done uh, through AMUG and they've went out to their organizations and they've come back a few years later and said, hey, I tried this kind of thing and hey, it worked and I was able to get this. And so that's why some of these examples I even have are from them. And so, you know, try it. If you can get it into manufacturing, you can get huge returns. And so um, I wish you the best as you try to get ROIs because it is a challenge, but hopefully uh, this can give you one step up uh, to being able to get that uh, justification strategy approved. Okay, well, uh, it doesn't look like there's any questions. And so uh, if you do think of any after the session ends, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my uh, number and email address is there at the bottom and I uh, hope this uh, session was useful for you. Thank you for joining.